It's Pittsburgh post game once again on a Thursday night. Seems to be a popular night for these. I'm Matt Geica talking Pens hockey once again as the Penguins once again take care of the Devils in much more routine fashion though tonight as compared to two nights ago. Five to one, no goals in the third period. That was a departure as well as uh, the Pens found the cruise control and it actually worked tonight in this middle game of a, a rare three game set. It basically never happened before in NHL history before this season, and we're seeing a couple of them going on right now concurrently in the East Division. More on uh, Caps and Islanders, which is very relevant to the Pens' interest, in just a little bit. A reminder, this is interactive as well. You can find us on YouTube, or if you found us on, on Twitter or Facebook as well, streaming live, just uh, fire a comment. It'll appear right there next to our faces here on the screen. I already introduced myself. I'm Matt Geica. Ryan Wilson or Gunnar Stahl on Twitter. Uh, from HockeyBuzz.com joins me for the first time this season. And uh, Ryan, you and I chat often online, and uh, I know we talked at least once on one of my previous post-game shows. Um, I want to say that was actually during that Penns Islanders series of a couple years ago. We'd all rather forget. But <laughs> you're one of my favorite analysts out there, and thank you for spending some time with me here tonight. Thank you. That's kind of you to say, and um, thank you for having me on. You got it. So, like I said, different feel to this one. Although, if you compare the first two periods from both nights, <laughs> uh, it seemed pretty similar. I think um, perhaps just an aberration there from the third period on Tuesday. Uh, Mike Sullivan goes back to Tristan Jari. That could be a, a subject for discussion here later in the program. But I want to talk about Sidney Crosby right off the top of the show appropriately because he scored his 13th career first minute goal. That's an interesting stat or fact out there that ties him for Mar with Mark Messier for most all time in league history. I don't want to know who had to pour through all the stats to figure that one out, but <laughs> I'm glad was they it Grove did it and not <laughs> was me. Was it Bob Grove? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's about the Penguins, you know Bob's got it all nailed down. I, I still want to get a look at that database at some point. Uh, but as far as, as Crosby goes, this has been a characteristic of his over his career, obviously because of the goals, but even anecdotally, uh, Ryan, I compared his start tonight, the the just mad energy he had at the start of this game with Game 5 against the Predators back in 2017 in the Cup Final. Obviously mm -hmm. a very different uh, scenario tonight, but he has a way of doing that, of always being ready to go. And for me, that's a hidden clutch moment, isn't it? Because uh, the game and its, and its tone is up for grabs early, just as much as it is in the third period or perhaps even... More often, it's it's uh, it's a key moment in the first period than it is in the third, because sometimes in the third, the games are out of reach, aren't they? Yeah, and I think it's a hallmark of his career. Of He does all the things that any player can really do, um, not even skill-related. Being ready, being prepared, uh, paying attention to detail, being ready to go at all times, consistent effort. Of course, he has all-world talent he combines that with. But there's something to say when your best players lead by example like him. He does not waste time. Uh, like you said, right? Boom. They're coming off a of five or sorry, what was it? Seven, six um, catastrophe. If you score seven goals, it's not usually a catastrophe. But him coming out doing that probably put the team at ease a little bit. OK, here we go. We got we got one. And those kind of games where it falls apart can linger a little bit and him coming out and scoring that goal kind of almost put an end to it right away. Of course, the Devils came back to tie it. Matt Tennyson scored his first goal in more than a season's worth of games, a, a normal season, 82 game season, not one of these 56 gamers. Uh, but the, the Devils, even though the, the game ended up being pretty even, we're seeing some score effects, I think, as well in that uh, the, the team that trails typically generates more shots and chances as the the game goes along. So the fact that it ended up being pretty even in shots and opportunities overall, a credit to the Pens for keeping the pedal down and, and certainly not going through anything that they went through the other night. You brought up something during the game on Twitter that I thought was really interesting. And uh, so often we think about the influence that Jim Rutherford had on this team, uh, Ryan, and now, of course, Ron Hextall and Brian Burke get their opportunities to put their stamps on it. And we see at least one evidence of that work in Jeff Carter's presence on this team. And we'll see how that works out, obviously. But Ray Shiro's fingerprints are still here, and in particular, his drafts. And he made so much hay, and he made so much of his reputation from those dramatic trade deadline deals. But at the same time, 
the longest lasting impact he has on this team long after he's gone and, and long after he's fired from the job that he got after he was uh, fired here in Pittsburgh are in his draft picks and in players like what we saw tonight, some key contributors, two guys on Sidney Crosby's line regularly, Brian Rust and Jake Gensel. Those are both Shiro draft picks late in his tenure. Teddy Bluger, too, he scores a shorthanded goal and continues to be an all-around contributor. So I just think that's hilarious because it was always about the dramatic move with, with Ray Shiro, or at least that was the, the perception of him. And I know he doesn't make the draft picks himself. He's, he's leaning on scouts. He's leaning on uh, Randy Sexton going back to uh, the, the guy who was in charge of the uh, the amateur draft back when Shiro was fired. So there are plenty of of contributors to that task. But you know what? He did a darn good job, didn't he, finding some of these mid to late round talents. He he deserved his fate by the end <laughs> of it. But at the same time, he left a, a full cupboard for somebody to come in and change things around the edges, which is exactly what Jim Rutherford did for the 2015-16 season where he hit on pretty much every trade he made that year and really revamped the team. And they were obviously the 2015-16 team is arguably the best Penguins team they ever had. But a lot of those core players uh, did, did in fact come from Shero, um, including um, – Matt Murray, who's now gone, but also the goaltender tonight, Tristan Jari, was a second round pick of um, Ray Shero. So it's <laughs> the goaltending is still even uh, kind of his thing. Yeah, I forget about Jari, the fact that he's been around for so long, uh, just in terms of uh, being Penguins property. That tends to escape me. And I did want to talk about Tristan Jari as well, because. Mike Sullivan goes back to him, as I said at the top of the show. I'm not sure I would have done it, just because Casey DeSmith and Jari, even as the, the goaltending level has risen here late in the season, Ryan, uh, it's not like one has necessarily poked his head way, well above the other and has uh, made himself clearly the number one goalie. And, and DeSmith has been more consistent the whole season long. So I'm not sure I'd be in that position uh, where I'm sure that this guy is going to get the majority of the opportunities and he's going to be my game one starter. I have a feeling, though, Mike Sullivan feels that way about Tristan Jari. And easy for me to say, I don't have to deal with personalities. I don't have to work uh, around egos and that sort of thing. And and I don't have to worry about stability. It's just me playing fantasy hockey from home, basically saying, well, maybe we just alternate uh, down the stretch here in the final 10 games. Um, what do you think about Tristan Jari's season so far? He started off so poorly. He's been better, but it's not like he's necessarily caught up with uh, some of the better goaltenders in the league yet. He's um doesn't have a large NHL sample period, so mm -hmm. you're you're not working with much there. We know how volatile the position is, anyways. Um, he certainly started the year poorly. I think DeSmith did too, and they both really <laughs> skyrocketed off of that and really put the Penguins in a great spot while they were figuring things out with the rest of the stuff. Uh, Evgeny Malkin wasn't playing great earlier, but the goaltending got a lot better to kind of ride that wave through. As far as who's the 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 starter, I don't know. I think Mike <laughs> Sullivan is what you you said. He's going to give Tristan Jari every opportunity because even when Jari was struggling very early in the year, he did go back to him a few times to let him kind of dig out of his hole. He didn't at that time. Um, I think I wrote today before the game. I, I was good with them going back with Jari today. Um, it's one of those things where. He knows he screwed up royally. Everybody knows he screwed up royally. Uh, you don't need to sugarcoat it. But here's your opportunity to bounce back and not let it linger over the course of, you know, when do the Penguins play after today? Uh, Saturday-ish? Yeah, Something Saturday like, and Sunday. Yep. You don't want to let that ride if you don't have to. Um, worst case scenario, if, if Jari did lay a, an egg tonight, he certainly didn't. He gave up just the lone goal. You still have to Smith. So I, I thought it was a win-win situation where you let your guy get the opportunity. And I think that goes a long way with uh, the psychology of playing that position is, okay, they still have my back. Let me go prove that I can do this. And um, it, it turned out quite well today. Um, I would still give Jar, or I'm sorry, I would still give DeSmith a good amount of starts down the stretch to keep them both fresh. But um, I think it's one of those situations where they will give Jari the the nod uh, to start the playoffs, but I would just ride the hot hand. I don't think any of them are 
like you said, they're not, they're, they're both here and there. So, uh, but it's a good situation. It's turned, um, it's turned okay after what was really looking like, uh, uh, is Jim Rutherford going to have to trade for a goalie? That's how long ago this felt like. Oh, sure. Yeah. I had that similar thought too. And uh, that was the story of January, basically, as the Penguins were, muddling through and uh, right around 500 when that uh, COVID break struck. And ever since then, they have been uh, among the best teams in the NHL, right up there with the Avalanche and and uh, I think the Golden Knights as well for best record since the start of February. Arbitrary start point, obviously, but hey, it's, it's a longer track record at this point. We're looking at uh, two and a half months of really strong play and, and not too many slumps from the Penguins who once again win. That's their third or pardon me, their uh, sixth win in their past eight games. And they'll go for three in a row against the Devils coming up here on Saturday afternoon start, part of a back-to-back -back at home uh, with uh, the, the Bruins coming to town once again on uh, that Sunday afternoon. So there's at least one opportunity for DeSmith to get back in there, and there will be another back-to-back -back against the Capitals, I want to say. No, it's against the Flyers before the end of the regular season, second-to-last series. So there you go. There's at least two opportunities for DeSmith in the final nine games of the regular season before we get ready for the playoffs. I just wanted to check in on the uh, East Division standings because as we went on the air, Ryan, the Penguins were technically uh, in first place just because the points hadn't been given out <laughs> in Caps and, and Islanders. And yeah, some, uh, well, the Capitals. Take, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Penguins are now uh, officially behind again because uh, well, it looks like the Islanders have uh, have won in, in, in a shootout. I'm not even sure. It looks like just the, the points being tabulated. Um, so the the uh, the Penguins are back behind. That was a 0-0 game through 65 minutes uh, with uh, the Caps and the Isles playing a three-game set, much like the Penguins and the Devils are. So uh, when it went to OT, there are no winners in Pittsburgh for sure. <laughs> and, nope. uh, well, we've talked about the three-point games and uh, how strange it is. So I don't want to beat that point to death. I want to take a, a comment here from Jamie Komet. He says, what's up, boys? Cappy looked great. Kasperi Kapanen. Talking about him scoring a goal, chasing Aaron Dell in the second period, making it four to one. And Kapanen, well, it turned out he blurted out that it was a foot injury, so we had to learn from the player himself, uh, despite himself, what exactly was was wrong. And a player of his ability, with uh, with his fleet feet, that can worry you for sure. But he gets back before Malkin and uh, gets an opportunity here. Starts on the fourth line, and uh, I'm sure, much like we saw early in the season, he'll be. Uh, building up in terms of uh, of time on ice. What have your impressions been of Kasperi Kapanen? Well, I guess, how have they compared to your impressions of him as a Toronto Maple Leaf and now as a Penguin in his first 30-odd games here? Uh, similar. I, I do watch quite a number of Leaf games because I, I really enjoy uh, quite a number of their players just watching them play. Fast, um, very... Um, He's great at quick hits, like up the ice, out of nowhere. I think his goal today was kind of an example of coming down the wing. And uh, he kind of used that Jason Spezza five-hole thing again. Yeah. Um, That's at least the second time he's scored a similar goal where he's made the goalie move, right, and then slid it right through. He's he's kind of a, a top six third line tweener where, you know, he can go cold for, for – but who, who doesn't really if you're not like a star player? Uh, you surround him with quality, a teammate like Malkin when they were clicking together, and it allows you to push some other guys down the lineup. I think he's been a um, pretty good addition this year, and anytime you can get somebody with his speed, um, I, th I think that's a positive in, in the NHL today. So, And it was nice to see him exhibit some of that after what I assume is probably like a hairline fret. What did he get hit with the puck in the yeah, Buffalo game? Yeah, that's my guess, too. So... He was he started on the fourth line tonight. They kind of wanted to ease him in. They noticed, hey, this guy looks pretty good. And I think he finished um playing on the third line with um Luger. So he's already moving his way up. Um after starting on that uh that fourth line. <laughs> yeah, just a toolsy player. And um I I'm not sure the long term fit here in Pittsburgh, but it does appear he'll get a shot with with Malkin here, which means Jeff Carter is probably going to stay at center. And I was discussing this the other day um, with with Hunter Hodes on our post game show. How are you feeling about the Penguins' forward depth now? I know that they still probably uh, could use a couple more wingers, but uh, they're getting one back in Kapanen tonight. 
Uh, and you look down the middle, uh, if, if assuming, and I don't want to assume too much, but assuming Malkin is back and he's looking like he was when he was getting things going in the middle of this season, you have Crosby, Malkin, Jeff Carter, who uh, appears to have something left, and also Teddy Bluger down the middle. That's pretty good, isn't it? I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would have necessarily uh, picked the Pens to be one of the uh, the deeper teams at center, but I, I, I would not say that's a liability at this point. So what were your impressions of that position, which it seems to be the consensus in, in uh, the NHL is the most important position and, uh, and for good reason. Yeah. The Jeff Carter thing, I think is pretty huge. Um, when it for, the trade was first announced, I, I was a little apprehensive. I'm like, can, 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 can he really still make a difference? He's what? 36. Uh, admittedly, I do not watch a lot of Kings games because they really turned me off the last few years with their style of play. And it's like midnight most times, but he's, it's a what four game sample, five game sample. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't, I don't need a larger sample to notice that his skating's still pretty decent and that he can still move around the ice. I know who he is as a player with his hands, the way he thinks the game and his shot. Um, and I don't think all those things have gone away. I was most concerned, you know, can he keep up? And the answer is yes, he, he certainly can. And Given what assets the Penguins had, not many, given the market what it was, they didn't want to move any of their uh, second round pick, first round pick next year, or any of the uh, Joseph, Poulin, or Laguerre, understandably. Third and a fourth round conditional pick to get Jeff Carter, who seems to have some gas in the tank, is one of the kind of under the radar sneaky moves at the trade deadline. And in hindsight, I'm I'm kind of impressed that they targeted him, got him, and that extra year, not looking as bad as maybe we thought at the um, time of the trade, plus a 2.6 mil, whatever. Right, yeah, 50% retained salary on the King then. So um, early returns are, are solid, and it just it, it feels like there's something building here, Ryan. And I asked you about expectations and your perception of, of Kapanen pre this season and, and now into this season. Um, I, I, was, I was down at least – relatively down on the Penguins and their chances to once again make a serious run for a Stanley Cup or at least go deep in the playoffs and be one of those teams that um, that you were looking to late in the regular season as as a contender just because the playoffs can sometimes involve a lot of of fortune and and uh, not necessarily the best team always winning but over a, a decent sample now we've seen a uh, pretty strong play from the Penguins and um, when Jim, Rother Jim Rutherford left in, what was it, late January, it was on the precipice of, of some sort of a, I don't want to call it a disaster season, but definitely uh, a fall off. And uh, the playoffs were certainly not a lock. Now they are, and now the Pens are in great position. So how much have they um, impressed you in their ability to keep things going, to keep this level of play up, and, and to once again, it appears, make the postseason, despite the fact that yeah, you know what? The, the window is undoubtedly closing at this point. That, that's not controversial to say. No. Um, I wasn't bullish on them being a contender before the year. I mean, you look at some of – Mark Jankowski was the third-line center on the depth chart uh, when, when you know, we were forming our opinions then. Mm -hmm. um, they've done a really terrific job of navigating some uh, really low points in the season. Uh, historically speaking, I think the Penguins have been a great team in March, going back to even Dan Bilesma days. Yeah. And I believe this was their best March they've ever had. So that speaks <laughs> volumes uh, for a team that usually outperforms in March anyways. Um, I think I'm, especially now that Carter's there for that forward depth, uh, Tanev skating again, that's good. Malkin skating again, it seems like they might get healthy before the playoffs. Uh, the only thing, um, the only caveat here is they've, I don't think the East division is as good as maybe I thought it was going to be before the year. And especially even at the top, but at the bottom, you got Buffalo who is playing better since they fired Ralph Kruger, but you still got the devils who aren't very good. In fact, I think tonight was their 11th game in a row where their save percentage did not start with a nine. <laughs> They're not going to win too many games um, with that kind of goaltending. Um, and that's not to take away. The Penguins have done what they need to do. They've been collecting points and beating who they need to beat. Um, I think they can get out of the East Division and make the 
the final four. I think that's well within the possibility. I do worry about who they face at that point with um, the seeding because, it, you know, they could get Colorado, they could get Vegas, they could get Tampa, Carolina, like a lot of good teams out there. Duh. You're in the final four, of course, but um, they're in a good spot. I don't think there's anybody in the East Division other than Boston, maybe, that I'm too concerned with. Of course, any team can beat any team, but Boston's the one where they have uh, Sidney Crosby's kryptonite, probably one of few players that can actually shut him down consistently, not just once in a while um, with the Bergeron line. And, of course, adding Taylor Hall, adding uh, Mike Riley and Curtis Lazard to their depth. They went from being a very top-heavy team to now having a competent second line. And if the third line with Coyle and DeBrusque kind of get some traction, you know, that's problematic, especially if Tuka Rask is in form. So, Four of the top 10 point totals in the NHL right now after the Capitals won in a shootout, uh, by the way. Got that reversed earlier. So the Capitals lead the Penguins and the Islanders by one point at the top. But, uh, yeah, four of the top 10 Point totals in the NHL reside in the East Division at the moment with uh, the Bruins pulling up the rear at 60 points. Penguins get their 30th win of the season tonight. Uh, I'm with you on Boston. I liked what they did at the deadline. They haven't scored many goals, and they addressed that. And I, Taylor Hall scores two in his first two games, and uh, I anticipate him being much better than he was in, in Buffalo. He was dying alive up there, to borrow a phrase. And um, he'll be he'll be totally motivated and also be uh, much better supported in Boston, that's a nice combination to have. Is this the first good uh, team he's ever played on? Trade deadline. No doubt about it, right? <laughs> uh, it would have to be. Has he ever played on a good team? <laughs> he made the Devils good the year that uh, he won the MVP. <laughs> that's right? about but it, though. It's been a, a really kind of sad career for him, and no fault of his own. But um, I'm rooting for him. Uh, obviously, I'm in Western New York. I, I see quite a number of Sabres games. Um, you poor soul, yeah. <laughs> I know. Um <laughs> He he wasn't awful. His his results were awful, but man, I can't overstate how bad Ralph Kruger screwed a lot of those skilled players up, and they all seem to be looking a lot better now. So, um, I think if if Tall stayed a Saber, which would have been crazy because obviously he's on a one year deal, I think you would have saw him bounce back like Darlene has, Middlestat. Uh, well, Reinhardt's been good all year, but. You're seeing them play with their skill as opposed to these robot, like, I need to play the system, even though our system makes us lose every game for like 18 in a row. Um, so I'm rooting for Hall. Um, hopefully not against Pittsburgh, but I hope he does well. Uh, what have you thought about some of these matchups against the Islanders and the and the Capitals, too? Looks like it's going to be one of those opponents uh, in the first round of the playoffs and the second round of the playoffs. They've been close, but the Penguins have gotten the better of those matchups. Do you still look at those as as uh, kind of toss-up situations there, or do the Penguins ha have something figured out here? Are they, are they just quicker than the Capitals, or uh, have they found something uh, in the Islanders that uh, they haven't been able to find in previous seasons? Prior to this year, they really struggled in getting any kind of result against the uh, the Isles under Barry Trotz. Well, I'm always down for Penguins Capitals. Those are always emotional, yeah. pretty fun to watch series. Uh, I think with the Capitals, um, the Penguins haven't played them in forever, so I haven't been like totally in tune with them. True. But their goaltending did not impress me at all. Um, we talked about Jari and DeSmith maybe not being hot for parts of the year. Um, I know... Samsonov was hurt for a while, but I, I don't think like um, that situation was that great for them. Um, they're they're an older team as well, like Pittsburgh. I think you're you're looking at a similar age team, not as quick though. So Pittsburgh's got a lot of speed, and now better depth. Um, goaltending looks a little better, and um, you know. It could be a, a toss-up, but I wouldn't mind seeing the Capitals. And as far as the Islanders, you know, P Pittsburgh did a really fabulous job playing them this year. Um, they really won, what, all games besides one, maybe, something like that. They didn't yeah. run the table, but they came close. Um, 
But then again, I remember in 2013, the Penguins ran the table on the Bruins in the regular season, and uh, <laughs> that didn't uh, that trend did not continue into the playoffs. But um, yeah, in fact, better those two than the Bruins. We all know. <laughs> Let's go to some comments here. Dave Glass on Twitter says his only thought about tonight's game is that he's never been happier to see a boring period than he was for the for the third tonight. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to go when you're uh, leading by a handful of goals. And uh, also newest comment on YouTube, Gaming with Geo is watching. He says, let's go. Cappy did look great first game back. Uh, he's also uh, high on uh, Brandon Tanev whenever he does return. That's another one of those wingers that will come back. He did skate today, so mm -hmm. and he has skated the last couple of days for the Penguins, uh, more to the point. Uh, not with the team, not practicing with the team yet, but Tanev, too, could be uh, back possibly a little bit earlier than uh, what the Penguins anticipated. Ron Hextall saying about a week ago, that Tanev was going to be uh, out for the rest of the regular season. Now, I suppose we still only have nine games left, just a couple of weeks to go, but still to have him on the ice, uh, Malkin's on the ice too. So uh, not that they're going to be perfectly healthy the rest of the way because that seems to be impossible, not just with the Penguins, but just with hockey in general. Right. Uh, things are looking up uh, in a big way there. I want to talk to uh, talk to you, Ryan, about a couple of things, uh, just more general hockey topics. Um, well, actually, one more thing about the Penguins, in fact, because Cody Cece now has 10 points in 13 games, uh, yeah. one of the higher scoring defensemen over the past couple of weeks in the NHL, one of the top five. Uh, look, I didn't see it coming. When I saw him play with the Senators, I thought stay-at-home guy, a guy who's um, going to be very limited with uh, regards to his ceiling in the NHL. Didn't work out with Toronto last year. Clearly, it did not. But here he is on a one-year prove-it type of contract, and he's proving it at least – He's a fit in the type of way that the, the Penguins like to play. Do you think it's a style thing here in Pittsburgh? How do you compare what he's done um, with the Pens as compared to his previous stops? Usage. Yeah. Appropriate appropriate deployment with the Penguins. Um, I think when Ottawa, he, I believe he's a former first, or not first overall, but first round pick. So yeah. those guys, they're always going to try and keep pushing even though the all the evidence is saying this isn't working you should probably tone it back a little bit but he's a first round pick he'll figure it out and they keep going with that and i i think he was done a disservice for much of his career by being asked to play minutes he wasn't capable of but he comes to pittsburgh he's on the the bottom pairing right now um and he's done a really nice job, and I can't pretend to say I saw it coming. I, I was probably, well, I know I was critical of the the signing back in October, but he's done a great job, and he's playing within himself, and the team is not asking him to do much more than he has, and there is value in a defenseman who's able to eat minutes and not crush you. You know, you, you let the better players rest for a period of time, he goes out there. Not a lot of bad things are happening when he's out there. That's the kind of depth that you can make a run with when when there's not huge gaffes. So kudos to Cody Cece because he's putting together, even outside of the, um, what you said, 10 points in 13 games. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even outside of that, you know, he's doing his job. Everything, those 10 points are just the icing on the cake. Yeah, it sure is. I would have just taken, you know, move the chains type of a, of a shift from Cody CC a thousand times this season over. But he's provided some um, some value added on the offensive end. Didn't see that coming, and he's impressed me. And it goes to show you that, well, these guys are obviously good. Or they wouldn't make it to the NHL level. And if you put them in the right spots and, and you don't ask them to do more than what they're capable of, they can really show what it made them, in CC's case, a first-round draft pick in the past. Okay, now some general stuff, because I do want to talk about some – Newsy things that, uh, that that came out recently. One of them, uh, a WWE executive, I never thought I'd say that on this show, but a WWE executive on a conference call today said that it was his impression that the NHL and NBC and the NBC uh, media group, um, Comcast in general, weren't going to be in business together after this year. We already know that ESPN has the so-called A deal um, for the next media rights, broadcasting rights contract, which kicks in next season i think most of us were thrilled about not just a new voice but espn holds a certain cachet with those of us of a certain age i think you and i are both in that demographic certainly looking back to the national hockey night days and all that uh, but i was 
I would say pleasantly surprised to hear that maybe it's not going to be NBC getting that shoe in B uh, deal. The, uh, the what's left after ESPN got what it wanted there or, or got what it was able to negotiate. I would love Ryan to see two new media companies, media conglomerates, however you want to call it, get a crack at telling the, the stories that surround hockey, because I feel like NBC has gotten stale and they haven't done um, a, a lot new in the past several years. Yes. Outdoor games, full credit to, uh, to Sam Flood and NBC Sports for getting that going. John Collins with the NHL, too, had a big hand in that. But outside of that, what have they really done with the sport to, to innovate here? I, I, I would say very little, especially lately. I would argue they've done the opposite. They've held the sport back. They are the, were the lone rights holders in the United States in all their broadcasts would criticize stars for little mistakes and glorify fourth-line players hmm. – um, Mike Milbury is your like dude forever. I mean, they did a really horrible job, I thought, and they did a real disservice to the NHL as a product. And I saw you tweet that during the game, and I was like, okay, good. Now, I hope another company is not going to hire Keith Jones and put him on the intermission, and I sure don't want to hear Pierre anymore. <laughs> so, um, I was looking forward to maybe Mike Tirico doing a few games because I enjoy yes, him. Yeah. But it's the I'll... one bright spot for NBC. I've loved what he's done. The guy's just so darn talented. It's hard to do what he does to be able to call a hockey game competently after not doing it for how many years in his he career. He can literally call any sport. <laughs> he's yeah. he's that good. So I'll take that as if that's the the worst of it, then um you know I can obviously move forward with that. But Man, NBC, I just can't get over like just the tone of their coverage. And you have all there's never been more skill in the league ever. And not once did they make an effort to highlight that. Not once did they make an effort to do alternative programming like hockey shows, not within a live game broadcast, um, just content to throw out there, whether it was on their app or NBCSN. It didn't always have to be on NBC. They did none of it. They just were content to know that they were the only game in town. They never felt the need to elevate their product or try new things. They just trotted out the same cliches and the same really awful product. Uh, those intermissions, I just, I can't believe that, that they were a thing for as long as they were. You could argue ESPN has tried harder the last couple of years to innovate with uh, regard to its streaming platform, ESPN Plus, with the In the Crease show and some other ancillary content they've had out there on demand stuff compared to NBC, which, like you say, has just been very traditional. They played it down the middle. And uh, I mean, congrats. You invented the uh, inside the glass analyst, which I don't even think we need. Usually it's just, oh, this team's really fired up because they're winning, and this team's really quiet because they're losing. Uh, I'm not sure how much value that actually provides. No offense to the folks who put that together, but it also hurt that it was Pierre Maguire for much of that run on the uh, the big national games. And uh, you and I seem simpatico on on Maguire too. Talk about a guy who just spouts meaningless facts and and doesn't give you what you're really looking for there. So um, an emblem of of in my opinion, what's been wrong with with NBC and just in general, I don't like the idea of only having one rights holder. Because you encourage complacency, don't you? That way, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, and um, you know, even it not only McGuire, but him almost specifically has like that ego of I know all these useless facts. But he would also go out of his way to put down um, modern analysis. Yeah, which I think was a huge problem. Weird. NBC never, never made an effort to include anything even like Corsi feels like dated now but for to them it would be groundbreaking it would be like landing on the moon if they put Corsi on the, the NBC screen um they just don't care and the the viewership deserves better it's 2021 we have all this really fascinating stuff that you can talk about and include in the broadcast and I'm not talking about miles per hour of the... <laughs> I did see that who, tonight again, yes. Who's skating. I don't care how long their shifts are. <laughs> Can we get expected goals? Can we get all this cool stuff that's out there? And I'm hoping, really hoping, that ESPN will lean into it 
um, and not go overboard with it. I don't want it to be the focal point of the broadcast. It's just a complimentary piece that might explain what's happening um, at the very least on the intermissions, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, that's my hope. And, you know, you got a lot of options moving forward. If NBC's not going to be the, it seems like they're out. You know, the internet opens up a ton of stuff. People have apps, the streaming apps. I'm sure Fox would love to get back into it and then use all of their regional um, mm -hmm. kind of channels. Uh, it'd be interesting if Turner got in on it. They do a great job with the NBA. Uh, I don't know if that's a realistic thing or not, but um, CBS, I don't know. I thought about them, but they have so much weekend programming with the NFL and golf. I don't think the NHL would ever kind of break through for that channel, but it would be interesting to hear Jim Nance try a, <laughs> an NHL broadcast. Hey, he does basketball. So I was going to say, I don't know if I can, uh, if I can imagine him at that high of an octane at that high of a, of an RPM, but, uh, basketball is pretty close in terms of speed. Uh, with hockey. I think Fox is a perfect fit just because you mentioned the inventory. <clears throat> Once the NFL goes away, Fox doesn't have a lot on the weekends and uh, they don't have a lot <laughs> during the week as well. There's plenty of room there where they could find some spots and, and they have plenty of ancillary channels and other places they can put things. And they've always taken chances with sports too. We can laugh now about the glow puck and the Fox robots of the nineties, but you know what? They were trying Love to innovate the and they, they were actually giving it an effort. And that's a lot more than I can say. For, uh, for NBC after the honeymoon period ended uh, about 10 or so years ago. Uh, one last thing for you, the uh, the Olympics, uh, I don't want to say they're a, a fait accompli here for the NHL, but looking a lot more likely, there's a deadline in place now with the IIHF uh, for May, I want to say, that came down to. Do you see the Olympics as a must-do for the NHL? Because I'll admit that at the time, uh, leading up to the 2018 games in Pyeongchang, I was saying, I'm not sure it's that big of a deal to miss it, but in retrospect, it was a big deal <laughs> to, to miss it. And I understand that it's not a perfect situation for the NHL. If it were the Summer Olympics, it'd be, it'd be pretty great, I think. And you wouldn't have to shut down the league. But then again, it's the offseason. Maybe players want some time off. I know they do. So it's kind of a catch-22. So maybe the, the, the best of uh, uh, or the lesser of two evils there is to just interrupt the season like you have done the past several times when you've played and and just bite the bullet and say that it's a, it's a long-term play, which it is. Selfishly, love Olympic hockey with the professionals. It's one of my absolute favorite things to do. It's awesome. I think the players care quite a bit about it, and I think you should throw them a bone once in a while. They obviously are very passionate about representing their countries. Selfishly, as an American, it really stinks that we are now maybe not all the way to Canada, but we got some pretty mint players and we've never got to see them play on a big stage as team USA. Because as we recall, the darlings of the last international tournament was team North America. Right. Austin Matthews, Eichel were not part of team USA and team North America is one of my favorites of all time. So I'm not going to throw mm -hmm. shade on that, but you know, the United States can compete now if they, you know, put together a proper roster and we haven't been able to see it. So selfishly, that's been a big bummer for me. And you're already blowing through a lot of these years uh, of these players because it's already a once every four year thing. Um, I guess my concern with the Olympics is I've heard whispers of maybe boycotting the Chinese Olympics. Yeah, which would, China's I mean, not doing some good things right now. So, right. I get that. I'm not going to um, open that can of worms. But that that's a whole thing that might derail it. But if if in a bubble, China wasn't a problem, all the boycott stuff wasn't a thing. I think you absolutely have to keep doing, it, especially if you want to grow the game globally. All the eyes of the world are on the sport. The officiating, while some people might say it's a little bit much with how many penalties are called and headshots, you're you're out of here for um, huge penalties. It's great. It's wide open hockey. Um, there is a discrepancy against some of the teams where the games maybe aren't so great, but against the core, um, the big countries for hockey, it's so fascinating. I love it. And I hope they um, hope they get back to it because we've never seen Connor McDavid compete for Team Canada either on a team with Sidney Crosby. Those are the kind of things we're missing right now. 
and it's kind of a Five bummer. Five years since the last best on best 2016 World Cup. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But <laughs> got to remind yourself sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, who does not want to see Crosby play with McDavid? Like, that would be really awesome to see. Put them on the least. same line for a couple of shifts and see what happens. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm guessing it would be uh, kind of a of a two headed monster situation down there. And, and Mike Babcock Canada. wouldn't be coaching it, and that would be good. Maybe they would actually play an interesting style of play. Yeah, that 2014 team was dominant, but it wasn't much to look at. I know that. Uh, no, boy, really. yeah, the, the last couple of games they played were not great advertisements for uh, Olympic hockey. But I think overall, yeah, I, I'm with you. And if if the Olympics go on and if uh, our nation participates, <laughs> our best chance to win a, a gold medal since well before 1980, uh, because that wasn't a great chance to win a gold medal either. Wonderful um, story, you, you but uh, go back a long time. <laughs> even, even the 2010 team that won silver, I think what they would put out there now is would be way better. Sure. Yeah, that was a mild surprise to see them go that far. And of course, they were uh, very close to winning it <laughs> all, goal. as we uh, we might recall. Only, only uh, time one last comment before we it. go from Twitter. Matt Popchuk says, not that I don't enjoy the national attention, but I want the NHL on a network that covers more than just the same six East Coast teams. Yeah, that's an issue, too, for me. I understand big markets and, and ratings and all that, but you know who you're going to see when NBC is, is uh, broadcasting a game. And I would like to see some more variety, take advantage, uh, throw in some, some different teams, take advantage of... Uh, Canada. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, of just... The fact, like you mentioned, you t you said it best. There's never been more skill in the game, and you can pick out any random game now and, and find several players who are worth watching. It's not like it it used to be. So um, let's move with the times. And uh, if NBC is done after this year, uh, let's just say I won't be shedding much of a tear. All right, Ryan, great conversation with you tonight. Thanks for joining me for uh, well past a half hour now. So yeah, good start for uh, for a game against uh, a last place team, or nearly a last place team here, a blowout victory, but. Pittsburgh post game is always about more than just the game. So we appreciate it. Tell the folks where they can find your work as well out there on the great world wide web. Uh, Penguin stuff at hockeybuzz.com um, and the Hockey Hurts podcast I do with Cameron Walsh. Uh, it's Penguin centric, but sometimes, uh, much like tonight, we venture off into uh, uh, holistic stuff with the NHL. So usually we try record those on Friday. So tomorrow. Um, so hockey buzz and hockey hurts. There you go. That's where you can find Ryan Wilson's work. Gunner Stahl, Stahl like Jordan Stahl, um, on Twitter is his handle. I'm Matt Geica. My name is my handle, M-A-T-T-G-A-J-T-K-A. -T -T -A. Thanks again for watching. Two shows this week and uh, looking for a third coming up here on Sunday. When it's back-to-back, -back, I usually just like to broadcast after the second game. So the first one doesn't go bad and, uh, and uh, pad expiration date a little too quickly. So hopefully talk to you on Sunday afternoon after the Penguins take on the Bruins, but still one more game against the Devils coming up on Saturday afternoon. Penguins beat the Devs tonight 5-1. to one. This has been Matt Geica with Ryan Wilson on Pittsburgh Postgame on Pittsburgh Sports Live.